Good evening and welcome to the shop here on a beautiful rainy dark night in Canterbury, New Hampshire. Thanks for stopping by. It's nice to have you here virtually in a sense, but it feels like you're here. So I'm going to treat it that way. And um, I want to cover tonight, I'm just going to wrap up a course that we just finished. Uh, it's been wild. I got to tell you, to be honest, right up front, it's been chock full of courses and live streams for four weeks. So I just didn't have it in me to, to pre prepare something new for tonight, but I thought, hey, why not just look and, and savor the completion of a project well done? You know, my father used to like to stand back after he did almost anything, even if it was a simple thing like painting a wall, you know, and we'd stand back and he would just look at it and go, look at that, look at that, Tommy. <laughs> and we would have to like, I don't think he was looking for a pat on the back as much as just the shared experience of a job well done. And it was something about just resting in that moment and savoring that aspect of it rather than just pushing that aside and just going headlong into something new. It's just good to stop and give thanks for it, I guess. It's like a mm. thankful moment. It's a, it is it's a moment of gratitude, but mm. of satisfaction for, for the work of your hands and your mind and your heart and whatever you can make. And then and then get back to work. So tonight I just want to savor the completion of this Bowfront uh, hanging cabinet and share just a few pointers. I know some of you saw the whole course and I, I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> I don't have something new tonight, but it will be a little bit and you are going to see the completed. I did get the finish on the cabinet. I didn't get the finish all the way on there the other night. So we should also mention that you didn't just build one, you built four. So, right? Four? Uh, seven. Seven? Oh my <laughs> well, goodness. yeah, they're not all done, obviously, but uh, I do have my hands full. But I'm wow. I'm ready for yeah. I've got four of the of the bow front that I'm going to show you first. That are the laminated and ash, and then I have three in white pine. So I'll See how show much you I know. that. Yeah. And we'll, we'll revisit those as, um, as I finish the white pine ones, but we'll talk for a minute about those in a minute. Hey, by the way, if you enjoy this content, um, consider subscribing and sharing and liking and all of that. We, we love it when you do. It's so nice to see new subscribers come up. It makes us feel like, okay, let's keep doing this thing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we are... Also, if you want any, if you want to go deeper with us in this content, head on over to epicwoodworking.com. Best thing to do actually is get on the mailing list so you hear about new courses we have. And the best thing over there, I got to tell you, that's really been a great launch is the neighborhood. And lots of you have joined the neighborhood, and I'm so happy. It's it gives you access to these these live courses that we just finished. So if you are interested in this bow front and after this little show and tell, then, <laughs> then uh, you can join the neighborhood and you can watch that as part of your membership. Or you can just go and buy that class and get mm -hmm. the full-size drawings that go with it if you want to build this. So We should also talk up that there's a forum on there that's a, a private forum on which you are communicating. Yes. Pretty regularly, so it's access to Tom. That's not something that's really out there. So That's right. We anyway. call it the Over the Fence Forum. So it's like we talk to each other over the fence the neighbors. as neighbors. Yes. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. Well, let's get started. Um, I'm going to show you, this is the one, this is one in ash that we glued up the last night. And um, I had, we put the back on it. Whoops, I got it upside down. So it's just a simple kind of hanging cabinet that I patterned after 
Well, I was inspired by it. I didn't really pattern it after any particular cabinet, but in uh, James Cranoff, uh was known for these soft little, you know, uh, bow front cabinets and in cupboards and things like that. So when it came time to make a hanging cabinet, I thought this would be sweet to make a little tribute to a master. And, and you know, it has a just having that bow in it gives you a sweet element. Let me, let me just pop this in front. We won't put the hinges on this one, but just so you can see the overall look. Very clean, simple, not a lot to it, but I think those who went through the process of seeing it made realized, you know, unlike your first impression, there really is a lot of little nuances to it to get it to such a nice finished form at the end and it's got a nice back on it and this is a French cleat so there's that angled cut under this piece that's attached to the back that allows us to hang it on the wall really effectively. Now one of the signature elements of a Krenoff cabinet are very discreet hinges almost invisible and he executed that using knife hinges and they're they're kind of tricky to install but they look like one half of them looks like this you know so there's two halves that look like that and I'll show you the installation in a second but this half gets installed in the cabinet like right down here okay so it fits in there beautifully and then the other half gets on the bottom edge of the door so you only have this tiny little 3 16ths of an inch bump out of brass that drops in on that and you can see they're just they just disappear all you see is a little bump of brass out the end when it's all installed i'll show you that in a second on the finished one so pretty sweet look it's it's meant to give you a clean but really nice strong support for a door like this so they work great, and it's one of the satisfying things about this project is installing those hinges. But this is basically consists of a box, just a dovetail box with a back on it, you know, or a frame if you think of it that way. And just the, the anatomy of that joint, if you want to see, it's just a simple... Um, well, relatively simple through dovetail with the through dovetails have a rounded end on them and they're cut longer by about three sixteenths so that they protrude when it's installed, just like that. And that gives you that look. And then the front edge is radius when you get the proper offset there, but this is one of my yet-to-be-finished pine versions. Can you talk about the durability of those knife hinges, Tom? Um, yeah, they are excellent. They're, they're not inexpensive, and the ones that I have are Brusso hinges. They're really precisely machined brass hinges, and, you know, a cabinet like this, unless you had it in a very busy area, like your bathroom, you know, which I'm thinking of putting my, <laughs> having his and hers, uh, you know, it's only gonna use a couple times a day, right? So, but there, you, you basically mounted the door on two precise pins, and there's screws going down into the top and bottom of the door, and then there's screws going up into the case. As long as those have a good, strong purchase, the, the uh, knife hinges themselves are recessed or inlaid into the wood so they're not going anywhere so it all really the strength and longevity comes down to the pin and those pins are beautifully machined tight as can be I suppose after a long long time <laughs> but they're really well made and the price reflects it they're not cheap I, I think it's we like can put the link uh, in there later if people are curious yeah, it's, uh, I think they're close to $30 for a pair of those, so $20, mm -hmm. $30. So it, it makes the, but you know, you pass that on to the client. That's what we used to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, 
so you can see this door has a little mortise for the um, the knob as well and when it came to a knob like let's just think about that for a second when you're building a cabinet like this like there's all kinds of choices you can make I mortised and we're committed to putting a knob right there <laughs> but um, you know you could get store-bought brass knobs or you know little bale pulls or there's all kinds of things you could do but um, Again, in the style of Krenov, it just made so much sense to do something more sculptural, you know, that would fit your fingers, that would be a warm kind of touch point between you and interacting with the cabinet. And he was known for this, and on the cover of, this is probably better, of his book, um, Cabinet Maker's Notebook, I've mentioned this numerous times, being such an influential book to so many current day furniture makers. Um, just the, look at that, look at that little pull. I mean, that's, that's actually a lift for a lid. So this lid here goes up, it's just a little box actually. And he made it so soft and sweet, like the way it's burnished and you can see the oils and dirt from the fingers. It just has that warm look. That was the touch point of this piece. So romantic. So he took time. Oils in the dirt of the fingers. Yeah, the oil in the dirt. <laughs> Get you right there. So, but you know, there is a warmth to the way he sculpted and softened the edges and the way the light catches it. So I, when it came time to making the pull, um, I started with a, a design that I thought would work nicely. And let me get these out for you. Tom, did you end up clipping the screws so that they wouldn't go through the top or the bottom? Did that? Ah, uh, yes, I did. I clipped them mm -hmm. back okay. just about an eighth of an inch just to make sure we didn't have a problem. So this ended up being the style that I wanted. And I thought this was perfect. I don't think this will fit in there. Well, yeah, it will, but it won't go all the way in. But you can see, I mean, that's this, it's longer tenon for something else. But if I could put that all the way in, you can see it's still kind of a large pull for such a small door. It felt like it protruded too much, and I was just like, eh, that didn't really work. So then I went smaller, I went like an eighth inch smaller to a, a one inch projection from the door. And even that felt a little much. So it was weird, as I refined this pole, it got smaller and smaller <laughs> to what was necessary. You know, it just didn't l seem necessary. And it also got more sculptural and shaped. So here's, here's one with finish on it. This is the original size that I thought I would use. Is it better to look at it against the white or mm, yeah, no? I guess nice. So this was the my thought initially like oh this would be perfect nice finish but that's that's a pretty it protrudes quite a bit from the cabinet so it's an inch and over an eighth and after the after the refinement you know going to an inch and then I actually went to seven eighths this is what I ended up with this is after refinement numerous uh, versions of this pull came down to this for this cabinet and so it you can see it's got this one comes in a little bit but this one tapers this way and if you look at it from the front or this direction you can see it sweeps in but it's not big and then when you look at it right at the front this shape is not straight either it's got a little bit of a uh, oval shape slight curvature to the side so when it goes into the door I think it'll fit into this one no it won't it's a little tight I'll have to but it goes in the other one I'll show you in a minute but it goes in and you know you get a much lower profile and just it just looks just right and it actually fits your fingers just right so that's the other thing 
in the shaping of this, you know, I was trying to dish it out and round it out so that it really feels sweet and your fingers would just get a really nice positive grip on it, but it would be, it doesn't have to be a, a heavy pull because this is a, such a light thing. And, and it's a, there's a magnet too, I didn't mention that, but in the course we buried a magnet behind here. Um, Let's see if the steel wool will stick to it. <laughs> yeah, it actually will. Let me just put a little, take a little steel and you'll see where that magnet is. This is like the old game you played with the, the metal shavings and moved them around with the magnet. So there it is. <laughs> it's right in there. And then there's a corresponding magnet right there. Okay, so the steel is on there. And so those two magnets come together. And if you do, do take the course, you'll be a little amused by my experience along the way when I actually um, buried one of these magnets. I conceal this one behind a piece of thick veneer, and this one's concealed behind the veneer. This is a laminated core, and then we edged it, and then we then we buried the magnet, and then veneered over. And when I did it. I forgot all about paying attention to the polarity of it and you know where this is going. So, you know, they're the rare earth magnets. So you had a 50-50 chance when you put it in there and sure enough, it was the wrong way. <laughs> so I had the never closing door. It would come in and it would just get repelled open. Uh, kind of defeated the purpose. But I did dig it out and reset it and we now have a good holding <laughs> door. So let me pull that out. All right, so I'm gonna transition out to the other one. And we do have, we will have more time, as I said in the description for questions yeah, tonight. If you've um, got Doug's any, asking so. if you shape the poles by hand. Yes, you certainly did. Yeah, but no, actually, um, well, it's one of the, I, I, I bandsaw some shape, but then I, I use quite a lot of sanding. So I'll use the, the um, I use an oscillating drum sander of a one inch diameter to create these curves on the sides. And so a lot of this is actually shaped with the aid of power sanding. Mm. So the oscillating drum sander was a one inch diameter and then um, a lot of the other radius, radius thing I did on my belt sander that's, you know, just laying there and I radiused the top like that and even put a little chamfer on there. But at the very end, I did take a knife like this and, you know, I just chamfered these corners in here at the end, you know, and then I just lightly brushed and sanded them. You can barely see that. So that these corners aren't sharp, they're slightly faceted in there. So everything has like a little facet and then the top edge too. I don't know how well you can see all the facets on this, but it's an involved little shape, but it actually is quite fast to make. And it's drawn exactly to size on the full size drawing. So you, you see exactly how to make this. Now this one, the reason that's other color here is I just shimmed it with some pine. The, uh, this had been cut, that tenon had been cut a while back and it was a little loose into the mortise. So I, that's the way I fix tenons that are loose. You just run a shaving and glue it to the side of the tenon and you've, you've rebuilt the tenon to fit nicely. And if it's a little tight, you just can sand one side or slightly rasp it if needed and get that thing fitting nicely and revived and good to go. So yeah, that's a process that we use the spindle sander and it's um, surprisingly quick. Anyone who saw that, do you agree the other <laughs> night? That wasn't very bad, right? To make Magic. one of these? I guess I thought it was hand done. You're right. I watched you do it with your hands, but you... You do it with your hands, hands but it's one close. of the more machine assisted, so yeah. you can... You can do 
it's just to carve that is just challenging to hold it. This is where an oscillating drum is really invaluable. Um, you can either have it a, a table oscillating drum. I've got a cheap Ryobi. Um, or you could um, just buy the sanding drums that you could affix into a drill or your drill press and just get the speed up a little bit and just use the spinning drum to help you cut these shapes. It's so gentle and slow that you have a lot of control over it. And then there's a lot of hand, there's not a lot, but you're going to detail and hand sand it at the end. I did just uh, put in the chat um, the link to the episode that we did on SNL about making drawer pulls. And I'll put that in the links later too. Yeah, I'm not sure if we went into making this one. We might have in there. I think I showed one or two. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good little episode. Think about different types of pulls that you might make. And I do believe we went into making this one. And how did you finish it, Tom? That All right. Well, what a segue. Yeah, Thank I just want to start talking about that. So we, uh, I finished it. I think he's speaking specifically of the pull. How did I finish it? Yeah. I finished it the same way I finished the whole cabinet. So, um, you know, I... If you've seen me any length of time, you know I love shellac. Shellac is an amazing, beautiful finish, easy to work with, so versatile, fast drying, repairable, pretty protective, but not really for tabletops, you know. So in that case, if I put shellac down, I'll usually go with wax-free shellac and top coat it with some type of varnish that has more protecting quality, like a tongue oil varnish like um, <clears throat> water locks or, um, you know, general finishes make some too. But it, uh, so I wanted to go with shellac, but I noticed like if I just put plain shellac, I didn't, I could do a show and tell on this, but at some point, but not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> if I just put shellac straight on this, it would look nice and it would amber up, but it wouldn't be quite as rich as if I first applied an oil to the the ash. It it looks a little more pale and opaque like with just shellac. There's something about the shellac, I think because it's such a fast drying finish, it doesn't really saturate deeply and bring out the rich variants in the colors of the, the pattern and the grain of this particular wood. And the same is true of cherry and a lot of wood. So if you want to bring out a little richness, a lot of times before the shellac, I'll apply an oil-based finish. So like um, Danish oil works fine, but that you, takes a while to dry. It takes a good, at least good 24 hours. You want to make sure it's good and cured before you go on it. Uh, but... One of the tricky methods I've used, and this will also link in our fast finishes video, was to use mineral oil. I only spoke of this recently, and uh, I know a number of you have tried it and really enjoyed it, but I was hesitant to share it because it's unconventional, and I haven't seen a lot of people use it, but I've used it numerous times, and it works. The, the reason I'm hesitant to recommend it um, but I am now, is that the mineral oil is like an inert oil. It doesn't cure. So you might say, oh, that's going to mess up the shellac. Well, actually, it's compatible with shellac. It was the first coating that a lot of French polishers used to put directly on the wood, and then, then they would apply the shellac by patting it on. And the oil would get it would help lubricate the pad, but it also would migrate out of the finish, but a lot of it stayed right in the wood. It had to, right? I mean, you're putting oil in the wood. It's not like the shellac is drying it, drawing it out. So the shellac sealed in the mineral oil, and as it went on, it just got locked in there by the numerous coats you get when you're French polishing. So a similar thing happens you can take mineral oil, and the nice thing about mineral oil is it's dirt cheap. I mean, you know, you have a little stomach issue? <laughs> huh? I've never, oh, I can't imagine, like, just gulping this down. But um, 
It's so cheap. You can get it at a grocery store for like a dollar. I didn't know that was a thing. Swallow it. What? I had never heard that mineral oil was digestible. I think so, unless I got that my oils wrong. <laughs> How about lemon oil? Would that be an option? I don't think so. I don't know what lemon oil is made out of. I, I, I don't know. It, it's usually, lemon oil can be, it's usually a mixture of other kinds of oil. So proceed at your own risk, okay? <laughs> um, shellac is a wonderful material. It will go over Danish oil. Of course, you want it cured. And um, you, whatever, whatever you do, uh, just make sure it's good and dry. However, in the mineral oil, it's not dry. But it's a heavy, viscous oil, so when you put it on, it doesn't really penetrate deeply, but it'll penetrate enough that it will bring out that richness and warmth and coloration of the ash better than the shellac alone. Because I'm going to use just a, a blonde, um, like clear shellac on this. And I'll show you what I, what I used in a second. So that's the approach I used. I first wiped on the mineral oil and then wiped it all off. And then when you... I spray the, the finish, like a pound and a half to two pound cut. After the first finish is dry, and you can do this just almost right away, right after you wipe as much of the mineral oil off as possible. Usually the shellac in a good weather like this, this dry, still wintry feeling here, we got the heater on, um, things dry well right now here in the Northeast. But when you put on a shellac, usually it takes an hour or two hours tops before you can lightly sand, and it'll be powdering up. And when it's powdering up, you know it's dry and ready for the next coat. I usually just lightly go over it with like 220 or actually 320. In this case, I just use 320. When you go on with the mineral spirit, I'm sorry, the mineral oil method first, you're gonna feel it. It's still feel, you feel it through the shellac. And it actually kind of gums up your paper a little bit. Um, yeah, here's a piece that I used earlier. So you can see those little dark spots on there. Those are little dark, oily spots. But then you'll hit it with a second coat. And then when you come and sand it, you might feel like you can still lightly detect the oil, but you're going to notice a lot less of that because the oil is getting kind of trapped and kind of... How about, uh, uh, talk right about linseed or walnut oil either of those options and I would use boiled linseed oil um, I don't I haven't used I haven't used much but again you're gonna with the boiled linseed oil that's gonna want to dry you're gonna want that let that dry I bet regular linseed oil would work but that doesn't cure either I'm just not I just don't know about the compatibility because whenever I would watch people French polishing that's where I got the idea of the compatibility with shellac was they would always use mineral oil as the lubricant. So I'm not sure if, if linseed oil, if some of you know, that would be great to know. It would be that compatible. But like I said, I can't even make those recommendations. And I, I was actually a little hesitant about the mineral oil because of the non-drying factor. But after two coats, you're going to feel, it's going to feel like it's drying up. And you're going to notice it powdering out. And I'll usually put a third coat on and then a final rub out and that'll be it. You could also add a coat of lacquer on top of that or whatever. But a hanging cabinet like this, it will be fine with just the shellac. You know? So let me show you what it looks like. This same material the exact, from the same sheet of veneer with that technique I just mentioned. All right, so there you go. Wow, that's pretty. This has the oil on it, and when you put it on, it kind of darkens the grain lines, and it just starts to give you a richness, and you can see kind of a chatoyance. I don't know if you can pick it up there, but that's only two coats of shellac, but there's some really nice curl in this material, and you can see how that looks. And then on the inside, isn't that sweet? I mean, look at, that's the same grain, that's the same pattern as this door from wow. the same veneer. So you can see side by side how this goes with no color, just the mineral oil. And then I'm using this bullseye shellac 
clear and I just cut it almost ha in half with denatured alcohol. What about wax shellac or non-wax shellac? How would you? Um, I'm using, this is wax. I'm not really worried about it. Uh, if you're going to use, if you're going to use it um, over, like if, you, if you're going to use like a varnish on top of shellac, I will always recommend, especially like a polyurethane or something like that, you, you would want to have wax-free shellac. Um, we used to always use this back when I, in the day in Pug in uh, North Carolina. And this, is, this still has the wax in it. And we would top coat occasionally with lacquer on the top of like a chest of drawers or something, one or two coats, and had never had a compatibility problem. I think that's because lacquer is very similar to shellac in that it's an evaporative finish. It's like a uh, surface finish. So by evaporative, I mean it just, you've got the, sol the solid in there that when the lacquer thinner evaporates off, you're left with the coat. So lacquer is, is like a little hotter, thinner. So it actually will bite and melt into the shellac layer and then cure in. Whereas like a uh, polyurethane or other varnish like that is a reactive finish. So it's curing by a, like a, uh, an interlocking reaction in the, the, um, what, what am I trying to say? In the actual solution of the, the resin. So there's a curing process, a changing. That's why the succeeding coats do not melt in to that coat. They, that coat is cured and it's hard. That's why they always recommend you sand to a certain grit so you allow some tooth for that following coat to grab and hold on to. Rather, if you just polished it, it would end up peeling off. So, but that's not so with shellac. Each layer melts into the previous. And when we put lacquer onto shellac, you're also getting kind of a hot kind of melt in as well. So even though you're using waxed shellac, it works under lacquer. Um, however, if you have any concerns, uh, you should always test it out. Definitely go with wax-free. You can just use seal coat from Zinzer as well. Seal coat is a wax-free shellac. Um, so totally up to you which way you want to go. But I'm this. You could quit with just one more coat of shellac on this, and it would be really beautiful. And I always just lightly sand with 320, and then burnish it out with four-rot steel wool, and then. A wax polish and you'll get a really soft sheen. Did you fill that. the grain on that before? No, I didn't want to fill the grain. I just kind of like it and it's not it's not that kind of finish. Usually I'm thinking about filling a grain on you know a dining table top, uh, occasionally chests of drawers, whatever. It depends on what it is. I kind of like the the tactile visibility of the grain on this. It's not quite like oak it's, it has a nice, nice appearance to it. And water locks, where does that fit in this conversation? Water locks is a tongue oil varnish and it's a wonderful, another curative reactive finish that cures each layer, cures one after another, but it's so beautiful the way it rubs out. I've recommended that many times. Uh, that by itself, you could just do the whole cabinet in that and you'd get a wonderful result or you could use it as your final finish over the top of wax-free shellac, okay? And you'd have good success there. So uh, can you give the ratio of shellac to mineral oil to denatured alcohol are all mixed in one solution and put on? Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, the mineral oil is wiped on by itself first. Don't, don't put the mineral oil in the shellac. Uh, the mineral oil is just... I just pour it into a little container like this and this I also use it when I'm sharpening the card scrapers to lubricate the edge but you I just dip a paper towel in there and wiped it on 
and then wiped it, wiped it right off after I covered completely. So then I'll just wipe that all off as much as I can with the paper towels. Then I just go with the shellac, which is cut to, uh, when you get this is like a three pound cut, just mix it about half and half to denatured alcohol. The stuff with the green is less harmful to breathe and all that. So that's what I recommend. But if you go, you can also go a little less than half. If you go a third, like one to two parts, you'll get close to a two pound cut. So I was closer to that. I was probably between a, a one and a two pound is pretty good. Usually, you know, if you shoot for a one and a half, that's, that's good too to spray or brush, you'll get really good results with that. And we've, had, we've done numerous videos on using shellac, I think, and mm -hmm. applying it yeah. that you could see that better on Shop Night Live. So I would check that out if, if you have more questions about shellac. Um, so let's just put it together, huh? Let's bring our cabinet over. This is our, this is the finished, how the finished cabinet looks. I got my shelf pins. Are you going to show any of the other two styles you did? Yeah, I'll just show the. Um, yeah, in fact, I think I'll show that right now. I'll just show you the. This is not glued up, so the doors and the pins. There's no concern been, for humidity in a bathroom, right? Not worried about any of that kind of. No, no. This I'm not worried about that for this because it's so small, and I used quarter sawn. On the sides, tops, the back panel is a plywood panel, and the door is a laminated ply door. So this is not going to change dimensionally. It's not going to change in curvature or anything. Mm -hmm. So it's really stable. Um, here we've got the pine version. The pins have not been rounded, and the, this has not got it rounded. But this is kind of how we made the door. We made a nice frame and panel door. This is also part of the course. Um, you get the full-size drawing of this cabinet and that bow front all on one course. And then we, we threw in the making of a, of a Cooper door as well. We made up this Cooper door in the course. You can see it's got nine staves, basically. <laughs> to make that curved shape. And this would be cut just like the process we use to cut this to shape. And you could put either um, knife hinges, top and bottom, or the butt hinges, which we did on this one. Check it out, we've got the butt hinges there. So that's another approach and technique which we went over as well. I love those hinges as well, they're more traditional in some ways and you see them right there so I'm gonna hang my Cooper door using these butt hinges but I could have just gone with the uh, knife hinges as well but that's what I went with so these aren't the final screws they give you these steel screws and those are good to do all the fitting and mounting and all that and then when you do your final assembly you want to put in your brass screws so you don't mar them while getting it done. See that? Hear that? That magnet. <laughs> but I've got to get a, I was talking the other night about just putting a little cushion in here. I got the magnet, magnetic pull soft enough on the first one that I made that the having the back on created like a pillow of air and so it would close very quietly. But these, I doubled up the rare earth magnets to give it a little more pull because it, it was kind of subtle and almost unnoticeable in the other one, but it was there. Um, this one has more of a pull and it makes that little crack. So I just didn't want to put, it would be cool, like leather right here would make the sound, but it wouldn't look great to have the leather there. And then those little clear cabinet bumpers, those just look kind of cheesy, you know, on a nice, custom-made piece of furniture like this, you know? So there must be the, if anyone has any ideas, that would be good to know. I'm thinking like the lightest, clearest, thinnest bumper material that you could just discreetly put 
a little top and bottom on the door so you wouldn't see it right here when you open up the cabinet but when it closed it wouldn't allow it to give you that sharp noise it would just be a softer thump all right so I'll set that aside let's put together the cabinet uh, so the the neat thing about these knife hinges are that see I've got them assembled already in the door but in order to put these on you have to you have to get the knife into the pin at the bottom and then you do the same on the top and then you have to with great coordination start fitting that in down there and then this one slides right in the recess at the top so there they are seated in there nicely and now we just have to run in the screws which I cut slightly shorter so they wouldn't surprise us by coming out the other side um, but I have a question about the butt hinges earlier Tom sure uh, Jeff's asking, are those hinges fully swaged, swagged, does S-W-A-G-E-D, is that a term? I don't know. Fully? Is that uh, a word? Um, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> I thought that might be a woodworking It, it might be a term. word that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's see a technical if I can get that. word about maybe it's a technical hinge word. <laughs> Does but, the Cooper door get veneered, Tom? Um, I wasn't going to veneer this one, but someone in the class was going to do that, and uh, so you could do it. But that Cooper door now that is going to expand and contract somewhat. But again, that's white pine and it's quarter sawn white pine, and that's the most stable wood in North America. So it won't, it won't expand and contract a lot, but if you did have it in a bathroom, you know, you would have that to be thinking about. Okay, the word is sway edged. Is that? Um, I need the definition of that word. I don't know what you're talking about. Is Maybe it have some something to do with the barrel? For how much it opens and closes? I don't know. Um, Swaging. There is a word. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I just Let me hang on a second. I'll, I think I've got... Here we it go. It have something to do with opening and closing. Yeah. It's pinned so they can't come apart, I guess. Yeah, here we go. Oh, That's okay, Bruce, yeah. Bruce oh, yeah, they don't come apart. Here's Here's the hinge actually right here. This is from Horton Brasses. They're beautifully machined. And the pin is, it's in there. It doesn't come out. But what I love about these hinges and what I show in the course is how they lend themselves to making a jig to install these quickly and extremely accurately. So we make a little jig in the course and, and route them the recess and because these are so uniformly the same, you know, one to another, they're just exacting dimensions and everything, you can use the jig method and you don't have to worry. Everyone's going to be just right. And all the holes are drilled in the same spot and everything. So, so I have a description. Swaged hinges close the gap completely between door and frame. Um, well, you'd have to bury it a little more they are they have about a 16th gap when they're parallel like that so looking at that cabinet from the side you see a gap however you can um, let in the leaves a little deeper but i don't i never liked the look that much being on the side of the cabinet for this one it was not a problem within with the with the um knife hinges they have only a 32nd of a reveal like gap between the hinges so it's a closer tolerance and that's what we shot for so there 
you have it. Now, one more thing we're going to add to this cabinet, and that is the shelves. Check this out. This entire cabinet is kind of a tribute to ash, the great American ash tree, which has been decimated by the emerald ash borer, made its way across the U.S. And, I mean, all we have a lot of standing dead ash trees in our yard. It got out here, and uh, so... This type of piece, I mean, it'll be plentiful and around for a while, but then it's going to be like the chestnut. You just won't be able to find it much. So there's all of this we made out of ash. So we've got the, the case, as I said, is all quarter sawn ash. The door is laminated, but then I used a beautiful figured ash veneer. Um, the, it was edged with solid ash. And then the back is veneered with Japanese ash. That's like a hundred, there's a video where we did, I, I you know it's like almost 200 years old, that a number of growth rings there. So that's Japanese ash. And then for the shelves, this is unstained wood. This is thermally modified ash. So it was baked at a very high temperature, basically cooked, you know, at, I think it's like between four and 500 degrees in a vacuum kind of chamber that allows it to go that high without burning up. So what's cool about it is it dries it out so much and it, it kind of like crystallizes all the lignum and whatever in there and the sugars and it you can smell like a, almost a burn, burn dust when you're sawing it. But the cool thing is it browns it out so beautifully all the way through. So you don't even have to stain it. This I, I cut up, I resawed this. And look at that's just got the oil on it. And then two coats of clear shellac. It almost looks like, isn't that beautiful? So pretty. You got like a reddish hint in there. Can you see it nice? Mm -hmm. And this one I used the little pads the little shelf pins. So I put little recesses on there so it wouldn't slide out, but it slides on there like that. The other shelves we use wire type that the shelf slides in over the wire and it's really nice too. One of these is twisted or something. It's all right. Okay, so there you have it. Check that out, huh? That's sweet. So, so nice. it's all ash, thermally modified ash shelves, not even stained. And then the pull that I showed you earlier was also thermally modified. Let's get this. I, I just finish it like this and I keep a paper towel like jammed in there. So that stays dry. And when I'm ready with this all finally rubbed out and the pull, I'll put some glue in there and we'll glue it right in. It'll go in just like that. And we complete the crayon off appearance. And your choice of that dark uh, material is design and color, or is there something? Oh, it's just to add a little contrast. It's, it doesn't have to be, but um, you, you don't have to do that. I actually went with, I did add the contrast for the others. I, I have walnut shelves ready to go for the other cabinets and so I'm going to also make my pulls out of walnut where this one is thermally modified ash this is there's no color on that that's just cooked <laughs> so I'm going to use walnut nice figured material for the pulls on the rest of them so they'll be a little softer brown um, and same on the interior shelves, not quite so harsh of a contrast. I was trying to just keep with the whole ash theme there. And let's just, I'll show you what I did in the course. We set it up at the end. We have a, a French cleat on here. Of course, this would be mounted on a wall. And then you'd bring your cabinet over. And that French cleat on the back just la lays right over. And you have the the two, um, they wedge right into each other and it hangs beautifully right against the, the wall like that on its own weight. 
really a sweet way of hanging cabinet. This is what I've got my tool cabinet hangs on a big French cleat. And there you have it. Check it out. Look, let's let's open the door and look inside. Okay. One more time. Okay. So Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Come on, boys and girls. <laughs> let's go. No, but just that feel, that is just so bright. I mean, look at it. It's not too big now, but it's it's in proportion. It's right, and it feels right. And when you open it up, you feel the little resistance from the magnet, and then there you go. You've got your elegant cabinet. And that just, that's just sweet. That's a sweet, sweet cabinet. So I am going to probably have a couple of these available um, in the Made by Tom's space. The, the white pine, we talked about finishing that as well, and that's just a tough wood to finish. You wouldn't want to use like an oil stain on that. Um, you can, but it creates like a blotchy situation. You can go right with shellac, but I forgot to mention, I know some people talked about it the other night, it was um, milk paint. If you, the Shakers were famous for making a lot of their furniture and cabinets out of white pine, and they were milk paint. A lot of it was, was painted bright yellows, um, oranges, reds, and uh, it holds up great. And it gives you a kind of a folksy old look, and you can do this little sand through technique and all that. Windsor chair makers are really tend to be really good with milk paint because they use it a lot for um, creating the Windsor chairs. I know Peter Galbert. Peter Galbert has a few videos um, where he talks about using it. He's a, w a great Windsor chair maker, and he shows a lot with. Uh, milk paints. I've done it a few times early on on small tables like I'd do the bases and then scuff through them and quite often I would add a little black to the regular milk paint color just a little and it would knock it back a little it gave it a little more of a folk a folk color sort of like that little horn blower up there uh, that I got from Pug and that was I think they painted that with milk paints, whatever, but anyway. Where do you get the therm, if you could talk a little bit more about the thermalized, thermalized yeah. ash and where you get it. Um, I, it's available here. There's a place in, um, the place that I know that has the kilns and, and processes it fairly regularly is thermalized. Northland Forest Products, but they, um, but that's here in, Kingston, New Hampshire. So if you're in New Hampshire, you can look them up, Northland Forest Products. They're just south of Highland Hardwoods, which is a really big dealer of wood, too. You could give them a call and see if they have it. And, of course, you all know of Goose Bay, where I go a lot. I don't know. I need to check with them. Last I checked, they didn't process that, but they might be into that now. I don't know. Uh, or carry it. Uh, I know there was a big fire at Northland Forest Products <laughs> that was limited to that area. So I think they had one of their kilns. They had an issue with that, <clears throat> but they didn't lose, thankfully, the whole place. So you have to just call around and call it thermally modified. I forget what the other word is. Someone sent me a nice article about it last time. And uh, Is it harder to, to work with or shape? No, it's uh, it's not harder, but you can tell it's dry and it it's a little dustier, you know. And when you cut it, you smell the the burned. Um, the wood has a definite different fragrance. Uh, it's supposed to make it uh, much much more protected in in the weather environment. So woods that might not normally be weather resistant. You know, like we think, normally you think of like the cedars and um, white oak and mahogany and what else? There's so many woods that are good outside. I think locust is good. But, but you could use a wood like ash, which typically is not good in the weather. But because it's gone through that process, it actually is much more rot resistant and uh, from moisture. So... That's what I hear. They it's call also it more torrified. stable. Yeah, torrified, 
or thermally modified, but torrified is the correct word. Yeah, thank you. Any other species you know that are torrified? Um, at Northland, I mean, they can do a lot of different species, but from them I've only gotten ash and poplar, I think. Those are the only two. I think they did some others too, but those were the two that I have seen that they've run through the process. So I'm not sure. It's probably not possible with some woods. You wouldn't want to do it with some where, uh, or it takes longer. So the ash is po porous. The poplar is a hardwood, but it's not super hard. So maybe it's more friendly to the process. But I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, if somebody finds some others and has had good success with some other varieties, that would be great to share with me or in the neighborhood. Let us know where to get it and some tips. Those are the kind of things I would love to hear, and it's great to, to pass around in the neighborhood. Can you show the French Cleden again here? Uh, sure. I've got it. Um, Let me get one that's... And, and while you're showing that, maybe you can talk about when, it, when are good times to use steel wool. Oh, okay. All right, can you see that? Let me just show you this here. All right, so this piece has an angle cut on it like that. I just go with a 40 degree. I lay the table saw over at 40. So it just gets glued on like that. So now you have that wedge. And then I take the cut, the opposite cut, and it flips around this way. And look, it goes right onto the back of the cabinet. Now it's got the angle going that way. And that's what this piece is. It was glued on. So we've got that, that wedge is opposite. So with that on there, it cinches the cabinet tight against the wall. And because it's vertical, there's not a lot of stress on the screws. And there's not a lot of stress on wanting to pull out the back. But there is some. So that's why when we pin nailed this on, we did glue the back into that rabbit as well. So when it goes on, you get a really nice positive solid cabinet hanging on the wall. You'll never have a problem with it. Um, it's not screwed on, but I mean, if you lifted it, it could fall, sure. But I suppose you could run a, I wouldn't, I just leave them like that, they're fine. Thoughts on steel wool, hon? Huh? Oh, steel wool, um, it's in the shellac videos that we have, I'll show how to use it, like, but I just always, I never buy anything other than the four aught, so it's four zeros, four zeros steel wool. It's the fine, and it's kind of soft to the touch, right? But before, well, let's do it to this pole. So I would, after I got a couple coats of shellac on there, three coats, if you wanted to knock this back, I just burnish it with the steel wool. And you might say, oh, you're ruining it, but actually, you're taking, you're softening and buffing out the sheen. So it stops being this bright, shiny. And then, let me see. And then you'll hit it with a wax and it will look the most elegant, soft sheen. It's just a beautiful thing. That's, that's with, uh, with shellac. You can do that so easily. That's one of the things I love about shellac is how wonderfully it rubs out. And the sheen you will achieve is just museum quality, okay, if you do that. But if you go to the other, um, if you go to the other videos, you'll see that method. It's, so, four Did you rods. finish discussing how you're going to finish the pine cabinet? I'm going to just, I'm going to experiment. That's what I always, I don't finish a lot of pine pieces. This is where you're getting almost into country or folk Furniture. So I'm I'm actually going to do one at least at least one in some kind of milk paint. I've had some for a while, and um, so I'm going to go back to that and try it. Um, I'm also going to shellac. So we also used to shellac. Um, we would use heart pine from down south. So it was like a version. It was like southern yellow, but it was a little different, like almost a a relative of the southern yellow, but Pug used to make 
a lot of, you know, the country or furniture in his home was this beautiful, uh, slow growth heart pine. And we uh, we just used shellac on that. So a little bit of orange shellac and then regular shellac and then burnish it out and it looks gorgeous. And plus it deepens in color. So the shellac is nice on the pine because it doesn't absorb heavily and it will it won't look blotchy where if you put an oil finish on this it would absorb in different rates and then around the the raised panel like across here it would go darker because that's kind of end grain cut at an angle and it just doesn't look great so but if you go with shellac it'd be fine you could play around with shellac and then a glazing stain so the glaze would then not penetrate the pine and get you know splotchy so that's another way to get color and also add the effect of antique and age to the pine piece so um shell's asking is thermally modified ash the same as roasted ash could be i think they do they do have a lot of terms for it um like torrified thermally modified i know i've seen it described both they describe it as thermally modified at northern northern what do i call it uh shoot What's the name of that place? Northland Forest Products. I was thinking <laughs> Northern. Northland Forest Products. They are thermally modified. So, I mean, I've heard it referred to as roasted as well, but I'm not sure if that is more of a slang term for it or if that's an accepted term. Um, Steve's curious. He says he covered some white oak last year on the footplate of his patio door, and he said it's turned black. you have any idea what he did wrong? He covered it? Covered some white oak last year on the footplate of my patio door. I see that it's turned black. What did I do wrong? Um, <laughs> it's hard to say what kind of moisture it's in. It, I mean, it could be a mold. Um, but it's not uncommon for wood to get gray, but sometimes it blackens out from mildew or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. It's hard to say exactly. Um, do you finish your panel before you glue up the door? I don't usually, but if I'm doing it in um, in the summer and I know it's going to shrink in the winter and be exposed, I will put finish down the edges. I will finish around the edges before I glue it in. I suppose you could do the whole panel, but a lot of times I'll just do the edge, get some finish on there. So if it does pull in, it doesn't look white, you know, but it's kind of one of those things. If you build in the winter, when everything's good and dry, you know it's kind of shrunk. Then you can, you don't have to do that so much, but it's not a bad idea to do it. <laughs> um, okay, when you skim plain glued up boards, do you have to slip match the boards to prevent tear out? It depends on the material. Um, if the grain is friendly to the surface, like, I mean, it's parallel to the surface, then it doesn't matter if you flip. But a lot of times, you know, you'll get in a situation where the grain is running up like that. And if you do, if you don't do a slip match and you just come around, then you've got grain running up and across the joint and you will have to change directions when you're hand planing. Um, I try, if I've got boards like that, I try to slip match always for the reason you mentioned for planing but more so even for the way it looks because you'll have a much more harmonious um, light reflection and you won't see the joint typically unless you know the surface is really weird pattern but it does depend somewhat on the species you know how easy or difficult it be to plane but if the grain is running fairly flat and parallel to the surface it's more forgiving so it depends what situation. So Anthony's curious, what about a sealer on the pine before trying to stain it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you could do that too. I would just put like a pound and a half cut, one or two of shellac. Um, that's a great sealer. And that's what I was kind of saying when I said then you could go with a glazing stain. That's, that's putting the glaze on top of a sealer. So you don't then get the blotchiness. 
Um, so that works. But if you're going to use like an oil stain like Minwax, kind of makes a mess of pine. Um, doesn't look great. So I would definitely seal it. Um, if you want brown, um, then you can also tint the shellac a little bit too to get some color in there. So there's a lot of ways to go. But that's why with pine, definitely have some experiment test boards before you dive in on your finish piece. <laughs> okay. Um, have you used true oil? Would you use shellac before that? I have not used true oil. Okay. Um, I've seen it, but I'm sorry, I don't have enough experience. Um, Ron had a question about a guitar, but it's gone out. I can't see it anymore, Ron. So if you want to write it in here again, I'll ask him. Um, question about clamps. Do you like clamps? <laughs> I like Would clamps. you like to... Oh, maybe this is the, a, a sarcastic question, as you can see in the screen, oh. how much <laughs> you have. So maybe... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a few in the corner. They're probably asking tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. Um, someone just recently emailed me this question, or it was on YouTube, and I haven't had a chance to answer yet. I'm going to answer. Um, about making those blocks uh, and how I made those blocks. They're just pieces of uh, plywood, like three-quarter-inch plywood backing, and they're about six inches wide, and however long you want to make them. And then I just took... I chopped up two by fours, you know, and I ripped them narrower and then glued them on with enough spacing for whatever clamp was going on there. So you end up with all those little spaces and, you know, but behind there is just plywood. Oh, I built it out a little with pine too, so that the, whatever clamp you're using has enough space. You just have to think about the clamp that's going in there and it just... I like that method because it's just easy to grab and go with them. Uh, you can also build something like that that is on a cart. So you can wheel around and go everywhere with your clamps. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's. I think um, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, those are some really excellent questions. Hey, it was fun to talk about the cabinet and. Ready? You good? <laughs> yeah, I know there were some questions about French polishing, and I was just trying to find those. We didn't really... Uh, um, did we ever cover that? You mentioned it at one point, and I think it just stirred a question for John. I um, think we mentioned it. I think I'm thinking, um, did we ever do a video of Shop Night Live on it? I don't think we did. But yeah, something. Something. Okay. Um, All right, we'll, we'll check out any more, okay? Yeah. You keep we'll, looking, and I... Maybe John can email that question to us and you can answer it that way because I've, I've lost it here. So. Okay. All right, everybody. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. We really wrapped up that project. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we savored it. We stood back, said, hey, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thanks for doing that with me. I enjoyed that. It's nice to relish in the job well done and look forward to the next. And I've got so many great projects I can't wait to share with you and explore on my own, like and to get ready. I've got some really sweet ones that are coming down the pipe. So if you're not in the neighborhood yet, you're missing out because you got a lot of great features in there. Check it out, it's really, it's really a great environment. And uh, you, get to, you get to talk with people who share your love for woodworking and are very generous <laughs> with their insights as well. And, and I'm going to be in there. You guys can keep correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, if you uh, enjoy this content, also please consider subscribing, sharing, and liking. And uh, don't forget, sign up for our mailing list at epicwoodworking.com. You won't miss a thing. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I had a great time. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week, the camera lady and I, right back here on Shop Night Live! Oh, my ears. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, was that too loud? <laughs> no, it's never too loud. All right. It's always good. All right, guys. 
Gals, have a great night. Thank you for being here.